went to Vietnam in, in late uh, 68, early 69. I was a little over 18. Couldn't wait to get there. I was going to A Company 501st Aviation Battalion. This is September 1965. Uh, I was in the 559th Squadron, and uh, I flew 201 missions there uh, in combat. People always, you know, when they want to get you in a corner and talk about Vietnam, I said, you don't have enough time today for me to sit down and tell you all the experiences that I had in Vietnam. The day that I got 25 holes in my ship, I said, you can, and, and the instrument panel was shot out. Or just when I got short and I was showing a new pilot a, how to make a gun run and the bullet comes up and goes straight through between my legs, I said, you don't, you don't have time for me to tell you about that. I learned how to visually track the enemy constantly night, day, through rain, through water, through triple canopy jungles, ocean. And along with that training, they sent you through dog handler schools, combat tracker team. A lot of people just totally forgot about that we were the first to make contact with the enemy. I attended Howard University and was commissioned through that source. From there, I went to pilot training. I went home after my sophomore year and I told my dad that uh, uh, I was wasting his money and my time. A week later, I was in the United States Army. Well, I joined the military being surrounded by uh, Marines, Navy, and uh, of course, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. And it was a, it's a fascinating thing to see those people in uniform and to watch uh, people jump out of an airplane was just something that just took the breath away from you. I couldn't wait to get that age when my parents would give me permission to join the military. And I immediately I checked airborne. I knew I was going into the Air Force to fly. I graduated in the uh, upper 10% of my class, so I had a choice, you know, uh, bombers or, or fighters. So I chose fighters, which I always wanted to fly because, because the Tuskegee Airmen was my influence. I went through basic training. I was the outstanding graduate of that brigade. I'm one of the first 11 black African-American students to walk at an all-white school in 1968. When I graduated from OCS, I went to Airborne School right after that. And then after Airborne School, I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And uh, I was an XO in a basic training company. And then they switched me over to become an instructor. When I left the ROTC program at Tuskegee as the Commandant of Cadets, I was sort of looking for a job. Now it turned out that my former boss, uh, Frank K. Everest, he was the commander of that training wing of F-4s. And sure enough, he hired me as an instructor to go out, out of davis Mountain in the 4453rd wing, the 4456th Squadron. Eventually, you know, you get enough time and you go on enough combat assaults and you go on enough ash and trash, you become an aircraft commander, and I did that. I had some very, very good instructors and leaders to say, go do it. Don't let nothing hold you back because being raised in, in the South, you always had that fear. Well, should I get in it or should I not get in it? And I must say I had white instructors and leaders that pushed me to all the way to where I am today. Left Davis Mountain in November of 66. From there, I went to uh, Cameron Bay. We were up near the Cambodian border in 25th Division, and we had gone up there to support them, and they were in heavy contact. I mean heavy, heavy contact. And the CNC ship, the command and control ship up there, called me and said that uh, they were running out of ammunition. And uh, uh, can you, uh, would you go down and, uh, and, and resupply them? Whenever I was going to put my crew in danger like that, I always talked to them, and I said, what do you guys think? I said, let's go. And so we went and got the ammunition. And we got, boom, turned around, boom, came out. Not a hole in the aircraft. Not a hole in the aircraft. Okay, flew back up. Billy joined on me again. And then the uh, 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 CNC ship asked me the second time. He said, uh, we have some people down there that are severely wounded. He said, if you don't go and get them, he said, they're going to die. This time, the guys were ready for me on the other end up there. <laughs> <laughs> and they started shooting at me. And I told the guys, get them in here, get them in here, get them. And I looked over my uh, uh, shoulder, and they must have put pressure 
on on one of the guys because he was I mean the blood was just uh, was just coming out very thick. Anyway, they they fired an RPG at me, and it missed. Anyway, I told Billy to stay out of the area, Billy Miller, and Billy went right over the top of me, and I saw his aircraft wobble. He got hit. He got hit personally, and the other two guys that we took back uh, survived. Years later, Billy and I were both colonels at the time, and, and Billy was down at, at Fort Bragg, and we were at the officers' club. And I said, Billy, you remember that day that uh, yeah, I told you to stay out of the area, and, and you flew overhead, and you got shot? He said, oh, yeah, I remember. I said, you remember I told you not to, to come in the area? You know what he told me? He said, Larry, he said, I saw the fire that you were taking. He said, I couldn't stay out there like that. And Billy was white. I didn't give a crap what he was. You know, he was my friend. You don't really know the character and the quality of the people you're working with till you get in combat. And then you really know who, who they are. When an aircraft went down, everybody came. When I went down, I went down my second tour. I wasn't shot down, I lost an engine. I was on the ground for about 30, 40 minutes, but uh, Jesus, I had all the help, and they, they had, uh, I never forget the two F-100s that came and started circling around, and they put a slick in there and picked me up. They were solid citizens. You could count on everybody in my squadron, and I'm sure the other squadrons as well, to do what they were required to do. You get closer to war dogs than you do to your own house and family dog because you know the value of that dog. The first tour, I got shot up real bad. I was uh, with, with the 101st Airborne, and I was called out with the first, the 187th, and they had received uh, uh, enemy fire, and they had the uh, uh, ambush, and of course, we jump right on the mission. You don't ask, no question, you just go. Now me, I, my dog repelled with me because he had got so used to the harnesses that we had made for him. We called it jerry-rigged. And once he get that harness, he knew he was coming out of a helicopter. Immediately, I put the dog on the trail. The jungle got so thick, so they sent a person uh, with me with a machete. Even though the dog could go under, they needed to cut that area where I could walk through, which was quite dangerous. As we went, I don't know how many kilometers it was at that time. Uh, I would say a couple of clicks because it was like three or four hours. My dog alerted. I told the commander, I said, sir, I said, well, this is, uh, my dog is alerted. It's time that I turn the mission over to you now and let your people move forward because it's just the dog and I, we were out front 150 yards or meters or whatever it was. His word was to, I want a KIA and we, our mission was to get one. And I don't want you to pull off this mission. So, being as, old, as a good soldier, I continued the mission. Now what I did do was put the dog behind me and put him on a shorter lease because I had him on originally 20, 25 foot lease. Labradors did not bark, did not make sounds unless their handler was really, really in danger. So he barked twice and I knew that was trouble. Well, as I turned, to, to signal that it's really bad up front. It just opened up. And all I know that uh, I was trying to protect that dog. That was my main thing. And I was able to push the dog away from me. When I did, I got hit in both legs. My first mission was a Sunday morning. We fanned out, the three of us, and when I rolled in, as soon as I was leveled out with the target and was ready to pickle, I saw something in front of me, a big boiling black thing that turned red, you know, fire. So I started jinking away from my initial track and reacquired the target. And as I pulled off, most guys break left. I broke right. And sure enough, the explosion had tracked me to, to, to go that way. And then coming back home, we were all white. We <laughs> That's right. After getting out of the hospital, I started going to the leadership schools. Being a weapons person, I was in charge of all the weapons. All the college kids that came through 
uh, ROTC right out of college. My job was to teach them to shoot properly to, and also to dress properly. So one day uh, I come by, my first sergeant said, here's a copy of your orders. And I said, well, where am I going? He said, back to Vietnam. I rolled in on the target. I had a three ship aircraft, a three ship formation. And I rolled in on the target. I had six 750 pound bombs and I, I pickled my bombs off and pulled off the target. And as soon as I pulled off the target, my right wing dipped, which made, which made me know that my right rack didn't go off. So I put it in burner and did a big whiff -a deal while my other two guys were on the target. And when I came back down, I released my three. But then I felt this bump, boom. And I said, gee whiz, that must be some jet wash, okay? From the other two aircraft. So we go out to the tanker and it was supposed to be a silent refueling. And the boom operator broke silence and said, F4 in its pre-contact position, you have right part of your right wing missing. And it was a hole in, in that dihedral about like so. And what had happened, an 85 millimeter round went right through that dihedral. It didn't explode. It was not fused correctly. And therefore, I wound up with a big hole rather than a destroyed aircraft. My second tour of duty, I was a, um, in military intelligence and I was a door gunner for the commander of the uh, aviation. Being in combat is unusual. Uh, most human beings never go through that. And uh, I defy anybody to say they came back the same way they were. I became a real leader over there. I became a real aviator over there, where my skills were put to the test on a daily basis. You go to war at a young age, you, you, you mature very quickly, and then uh, you come back, you expect open arms. Oh, it was not true. And when I came back, uh, I wasn't spit on, but I was looked at in disdain. That was the time when all the draft archers were against us for going to Vietnam. They treated us like animus. And we come into the airport, and they was up on a ramp, and they threw feces on us, they threw beer on us, they threw beer cans at us. You kill babies, I mean, they just, they just gave us a <laughs> they gave us a wreck over that you and it was the worst homecoming that you can ever believe in. When, when a soldier tell you that, it is def definitely true. And that was in April 1970. A lot of guys that came home uh, were told to take their uniforms off in, in, in civilian clothes. I didn't have any civilian clothes. So I wore my uniform and, and I was proud to wear my uniform yeah, right. because my country sent me over there and I did the best that I could do. You know, and, and uh, I, to this day, I don't have any regrets about it. War is a very unpopular thing to, uh, to be in and start with. And then you have to let all of the, your personal feelings and attitudes go away because you are a warrior. And that's, that's your, your job on this earth, is to win for the United States of America. <laughs>